Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I want to get started so we uh, can hear everything that we want to hear from Dr. Mustelin here. So Dr. Mustelin, I have the pleasure of introducing today. He is the Herndon and Ether Mori Endowed Professor in Rheumatoid Arthritis here at the University of Washington. He studied at the University of Helsinki in Finland, where he received his MD and his doctorate in medical science. He completed clinical training in Finland and then did postdoctoral training down in Southern California at the Scripps Research Institute. He later in his career then received an MA in Enterprise Leadership at the Harvard Business School. Dr. Mousselin has a rich career in both the academic and the biotech spheres. As he told me, he took a, a brief 10-year sabbatical in, in the biotech industry. Um, he is an author on over 230 papers, and he has mentored over 35 uh, scientific trainees over the years. His work focuses on elucidating the molecular pathogenesis of autoimmune diseases that we will hear about today. And he, um, during that brief 10-year sabbatical, was uh, worked in several positions where he was the uh, directed research and discovery of novel therapeutics. And his teams delivered 24 candidate therapeutics into clinical trials, several of which are efficacious in phase two and phase three studies. So please join me in welcoming him to the podium today to tell us all about his interesting work. This working? Yes. So thanks very much uh, for the very kind and nice in introduction. And I'm, I'm uh, really uh, pleased to be invited to uh, give the, the grand rounds here today. I'm, I'm also really grateful for the endowed professorship, which greatly helped me uh, select the topic for uh, today's presentation, which is rheumatoid uh, arthritis. So I'm going to jump right into it. Um, and here are my uh, disclosures, some of which you just heard about. Um, and I'm assuming that all of you are very familiar with what rheumatoid arthritis is and what a patient uh, looks like and what uh, the challenges are and the treatment options. So I'm not going to uh, give you any general introduction to the disease itself. But what I will uh, start by is uh, stating what I think is the grand hypothesis um, that I'm uh, starting from, and I, I think this is quite well uh, accepted in the rheumatological scientific uh, community. Namely, uh, that rheumatoid arthritis, as the core of it, is an autoimmune disease uh, primarily targeting um, post-translationally modified proteins, uh, uh, more specifically uh, those that are de-immunated on their arginines, uh, also known as citrullinated uh, proteins. And the, the idea is that uh, such uh, modifications create epitopes that the immune system is simply not used to seeing and autoimmunity uh, ensues. So um, citrullination therefore is the main topic of uh, my uh, research in the, in the lab uh, for the last uh, year and a half or so and, and before that as well. Um, we've come to understand that citrullination is not all bad. There is clearly citrullination uh, in, in healthy people, so physiologically meaningful citrullination uh, reactions. Uh, and something else is going on in rheumatoid arthritis. There's either much more citrullination or citrullination of epitopes that should not normally be citrullinated. And I refer to that as uh, pathological uh, citrullination. So the, the general hypothesis then is that this citrullination uh, is what causes the autoimmunity and is a target for it. And if we could only stop it in a way where we would prevent the pathological situation, but perhaps allowing some of the normal situation to uh, continue to occur, that that would have a uh, deep therapeutic benefit uh, for the patients. And I think it's fairly obvious that in order to do so, we would have to understand in much greater detail uh, what situation uh, how and when and why it occurs and understand uh, exactly the mechanisms behind it so that we could choose a uh, method of, of trying to block uh, the pathological situation and uh, help our patients. So that's really the basis of, of what I'm going to uh, tell you about. 
So first, uh, citrullination uh, or, or peptide uh, arginine deimmunation is a reaction that uh, involves uh, enzymes called uh, PADS that specifically uh, remove uh, this nitrogen in an arginine side chain and making it uh, into a carbonyl uh, releasing um, ammonia. And very importantly, this is a highly uh, calcium dependent uh, family of enzymes. So calcium uh, is required by the enzymes actually in the millimolar uh, uh, range. And that turns out to be quite important. So what does citrullination do? Well, first of all, uh, removing uh, the charge of an arginine is a fairly big change uh, to a protein. So uh, uh, the charge that sits on arginine residues is important in many proteins for their folding, for their function, for enzymatic properties, for protein-protein interactions, and possibly many other uh, important uh, details of how a protein uh, works. So that will change. Um, the second thing is, as I mentioned already, um, the immune system is trained to recognize self-peptides uh, on MHC and uh, ignore them and not mount an immune response. However, if you remove that charge from an arginine, there's a good chance that the peptide uh, that now sits on MHC will look like a foreign peptide to the immune system uh, to trigger an, an autoimmune uh, response. So, what do we know about citrullination in rheumatoid arthritis? Well, first, um, it was discovered exactly 20 years ago that uh, uh, antibodies uh, from rheumatoid arthritis patients have this unusual property of recognizing citrullinated uh, proteins. And the first one was filaggrin, which is a fairly common protein in skin and citrullinated. And eventually, uh, it was realized that these anti-citrullinated autoantibodies recognize a variety of different citrullinated uh, epitopes on proteins. And there's a fairly simple assay that uses a, a cyclic citrullinated peptide um, and it, at high concentration um, to d detect whether a, a patient has these autoantibodies or not. And uh, about 70 to 80 percent of all RA patients do have these autoantibodies and um, in the diagnostic criteria for RA, that's an important uh, factor in establishing that their uh, joint disease, in fact, is rheumatoid arthritis. Um, these antibodies have been studied greatly. Um, it's clear that they uh, often appear uh, years before the diagnosis is made, before there is a clinically manifest uh, disease. So clearly the immune pathology that begins years before you have a uh, a disease uh, involves uh, this anti-citrullinated uh, immune response. Typically, the titers go up fairly sharply around the time of, of diagnosis. Another uh, important um, piece of evidence is that uh, there's a genetic association of the disease with polymorphisms in two of the five enzymes that can citrullinate uh, proteins, namely PAD2 and PAD4. Uh, so these are the two enzymes people have mostly focused uh, on in the field. So clearly there is a, a presence of both of these enzymes in the joint, in the uh, synovial fluid, um, and in the leukocytes, uh, immune cells that are in the joint, including in the germinal center reactions and more diffusely around the inflamed uh, area of the joint. Uh, you can also find an abundance of proteins that are citrullinated uh, in the joint of most patients. Uh, and many studies have taken synovial fluid and analyzed it by mass spectrometry to identify what all these citrullinated proteins are. And for example, in one uh, very remarkable uh, Norwegian paper uh, a couple of years ago, they identified uh, almost 130 different proteins, many of them citrullinated in multiple uh, sites uh, in the synovial fluid of a single RA patient. Uh, in contrast, in normal healthy people, you typically don't find any at all, or at most one or two uh, such proteins. So the increase is, I think, quite remarkable and detectable uh, with the right reagents. It's also become clear that uh, certain citrullinated peptides are really well presented by MHC molecules and particularly by those haplotypes that are enriched uh, in, in RA patients. So the, the so-called uh, shared epitope class of 
uh, HLA-DR anti, uh, antigens um, typically have a great propensity of uh, presenting the citrullinated peptide uh, and not so much the, the regular arginine containing peptide from uh, well known citrullinated proteins like the mentin. So the immunological basis for the HLA association matches well with the anti citrullination uh, autoimmunity. And then finally, um, a number of known risk factors uh, in RA. Uh, not only the HLA association, but also things like periodontitis and uh, smoking um, correlate uh, and, and have to do with this. So smoking, uh, for some reason, increases the citrullination, particularly in the lung, by mechanisms that still are somewhat obscure. Uh, periodontitis, again, is a different example. Uh, certain bacteria that cause uh, gingivitis, such as Porphyromonas gingiva gingivalis, have their own citrullating enzyme, their own PAD, and they, they uh, perhaps for immune evading reasons, citrullinate a number of host proteins that probably can contribute to uh, the autoimmune response in the patients. And then there's a really special case that I think also illustrates very, in a very interesting way the power of citrullination in driving rheumatoid arthritis. So a group uh, led by Anthony Rosen and Felipe Andrade at Johns Hopkins uh, reported a few years ago that uh, some patients, and about 15 to 20 percent of all RA patients, um, have autoantibodies against PAD4 uh, with a specific property of activating the enzyme. So in these patients, there's much more citrullination, there's much more anti-citrullinated antibodies and they have a very aggressive form of RA that progresses quickly uh, to joint erosions and also tends to be a bit more resistant to uh, treatment. So what are we trying to do about all of this? Um, what we are trying to do is, is very simple in, in, uh, to say but very difficult to do. We are trying to figure out what the molecular mechanisms are that drive increased citrullination in the actual patient. So citrullination was uh, discovered in patients. It was not discovered in mice. And in fact, most mouse models of arthritis do not really include a role for citrullination. So we have to study uh, humans, which I prefer to do anyway. I think the, the reality of the disease, particularly something like rheumatoid arthritis, really lies uh, in the patient. So this is uh, somewhat challenging, but I think we are uh, beginning to make some, uh, some headway. So what we would like to know is how does citrullination occur in these patients and why does it occur? So where do we cross that line between the normal, pretty minimal citrullination to the excessive uh, citrullination that results in a, in a disease? It would be great to understand if it's PAD2 or PAD4 that's responsible for the uh, pathological citrullination. Uh, it might be both, uh, but there really is very little understanding of this uh, at the moment. Uh, it also would be good to know, and I will come back to this uh, in much more detail in a moment, whether the citrullination that drives disease happens inside of cells or outside of the cells. And I'll, I'll uh, mention that in a little bit uh, longer here. And finally, it would be good to know, uh, because I think it's an emerging theme, are all rheumatoid arthritis patients the same? I think very unlikely. I think there are different variants or forms of rheumatoid arthritis I mean, for example, there is a minority of patients who have a, a disease that looks very much like rheumatoid arthritis, but they do not have anti-citrullinated autoantibodies and maybe no increase in citrullination at all. That clearly, molecularly, is likely a different kind of disease. It may need its own name. But even within the, within the patients who have uh, anti-citrullinated autoantibodies, there probably are variants of the disease. You could imagine different molecular mechanisms leading to these antibodies. And one mechanism might be true in one patient and a different one in a different patient. That's uh, important to keep in mind. So if you um, then ask uh, how citrullination may occur and you read the literature on citrullination, what people have proposed uh, might be going on in patients, you come up with about uh, four or perhaps five different mechanisms that have been proposed. The most, um, I think, um, common one that most people have believed for several years, but I think it's 
uh, it, it's coming out of vogue a little bit. There's an increasing skepticism to this particular mechanism, but it's still one that uh, you have to uh, consider, which is neutrophil netosis. So neutrophils, uh, we've learned in the, in the last years, have many very specific behaviors that they can undertake uh, in order to uh, combat infection and, and other uh, inflammatory um, threats to, uh, to the host. One of them is netosis, which is a, an elaborate process during which the neutrophil spits out a large portion of its nuclear DNA and perhaps also some of its mitochondrial DNA. DNA is very sticky. It will uh, bind to pathogens. It will also uh, adhere many molecules that are anti-inflammatory and anti-viral uh, particularly. So nets really work sort of as the name implicates as a net where you can catch uh, pathogens like bacteria uh, and other offenders. Um, there is a literature proposing that citrullination, particularly of histones, is involved in the netosis response. Uh, and the idea is that uh, citrullination of histones may help unwind the nucleosomal DNA to make it free and accessible uh, for spitting out, uh, extruding uh, from the cell. However, um, there is not that much citrullination. I'll show you uh, some data in a moment. The second mechanism which was uh, proposed by uh, the colleagues that I mentioned earlier from Johns Hopkins, which we actually collaborated uh, with as well, they, they found that um, there's another mechanism to induce a tremendous amount of citrullination in neutrophils. And it simply consists of giving neutrophils um, so-called membranolytic uh, stimuli, uh, which physiologically in an uh, in immune context would be either the membrane attack complex of complement or perforin, which also, so both of these uh, form pores that are incorporated into the membrane of a target cell uh, and, and make a um, uh, channel that's big enough for calcium and many other things to equilibrate over the plasma membrane. So as I said uh, earlier, the, the pads are calcium dependent. Uh, normally in the resting cell, uh, the calcium concentration is, is about 150 nanomolar, which is like four orders of magnitude lower than the pads require. However, if you put a big hole in the membrane on a, of a neutrophil, um, the one and a half millimolar or so of calcium in the medium will uh, rush in and the intracellular calcium concentration will rise up to well within the range of what the pads need and they will citrullinate a lot of things. And I'll come back again to that in just a little moment. There are two other mechanisms which uh, we discovered in, in, in my lab a few years ago and uh, not knowing at the time at all what they might mean, and we still kind of uh, puzzle about what this might mean. But uh, neutrophils have this um, surprising ability to expose uh, PAD4 on their surface. And I'll show you some data in a second. We also found in the same context, also to our surprise, that uh, live happy neutrophils can uh, deliberately secrete out PAD2 into the surrounding medium. And I'll show you data in a second of that too. So let's start with the uh, PAD4 on the surface. Um, the, the literature uh, did not uh, have any precedent for this, so we were quite surprised when we, um, and, and when I say we, it was uh, Ye Bin Zhu who was a postdoc in my lab at the time. Um, we, we were looking at the location of PAD4 and found that it was mostly in small spots all over the cell, and it looked like some of those spots were very close to the plasma membrane. So we did an experiment that probably, um, you know, the literature didn't suggest that you should do. We did, it, we did it anyway, and we found to our surprise that even if the neutrophils are unpermeabilized, and in fact are happy and viable, we can see PAD4 with an antibody uh, on their outside. And we did multiple controls. So for example, here, uh, what we did, um, here's an isotype control. Um, this is the mean fluorescent intensity. Here's the PAD4 uh, antibody, clearly more, as you can see the shift in the curve. If we add a uh, recombinant uh, protein, uh, PAD2 protein to, to uh, the assay, nothing happens. But if we add recombinant PAD4 protein, it will compete and the signal will disappear, showing that the, the, the signal we see really is specific for uh, PAD4. Um, 
And we went on to uh, do multiple controls uh, to convince ourselves uh, first and then the reviewers eventually. Uh, for example, we used a whole blood assay in which we took fresh blood from, from patients and stained them directly and into the flow cytometer, so no manipulation, no time for neutrophils to, to die or misbehave or get activated. And uh, the data always were very clear. So, in other words, uh, neutrophils have PAD4 on the surface. They do not have PAD2. And this just shows you um, uh, what happens to that surface uh, exposed PAD4 when you activate the neutrophils. Uh, it goes up. So almost all activating stimuli for neutrophil make them expose more PAD4 on the surface. So that looks kind of like a physiological uh, response. There are some exceptions. So IL-8, for example, which is a really potent chemotactic for neutrophils, doesn't do anything to PAD4 expression. So there's selectivity uh, in the response, um, and it's, the induction is dose-dependent and looks like a real thing. At the time, we had no idea uh, why this would uh, occur, but we speculated perhaps um, there is some physiological purpose of having a citrullinating enzyme on, this, on the surface of a cell that plays an important role in the in immune defense. Uh, and I'll leave it at that until uh, a little bit later on here. So having an enzyme on the surface is one thing. Um, the other question is, is it actually doing something? Is it active? So we did a very simple experiment uh, that came out uh, in a way much greater than we had even dreamed of. So we took uh, uh, healthy neutrophils, um, freshly isolated, uh, all viable still at this point in time, and we put them in medium uh, that reflects um, the extracellular medium, so there's uh, about two millimolar calcium in it, and not much else. And then we added uh, fibrinogen, which is a really good substrate for citrullination, just to see if these neutrophils could uh, modify it. And they do. In a relatively short uh, number of minutes, they will citrullinate that uh, fibrinogen very, very extensively. So if we don't have neutrophils uh, present, it's in this lane here, or if we don't have fibrinogen, of course we don't have any citrullination. And if we add a recombinant uh, PAD4, we do uh, get some citrullination. So a great surprise, if we had neutrophils in the medium and then removed them and then used just the medium alone, there was also uh, citrullination, fairly weak in this particular experiment, but we often saw it very uh, clearly. So we decided to do uh, the same experiment uh, with another uh, substrate, which is histone. Histone H3 is really well citrullinated by, by the pads. So here, the same thing uh, occurred again. So within really a short uh, time course, we get an extensive citrullination of histone. Um, it doesn't happen if there's no neutrophils there. Uh, and we see it with recombinant protein. We also see it, in this case, really strongly with just supernatant that the uh, uh, neutrophils have been swimming in for a brief moment. So we figured uh, most likely then uh, that supernatant contains some PAD4 that's been shed off the surface of neutrophils. And that turned out to be uh, completely wrong. In fact, what's in that medium uh, is PAD2. So, like I said, PAD2 was not detected on the surface, uh, but it's detected very nicely in the, in the supernatant. We verified that by, uh, by blotting. Uh, these are uh, four different uh, donors. Um, we detected it by mass spectrometry. Uh, several peptides. There is a tiny little, um, tiny amount of PAD4 that probably is uh, shed. Um, to show, to, to ask the question of which one is active and doing the job, uh, we used uh, two uh, antibodies. These are actually uh, human monoclonal antibodies made against PAD2 and PAD4 that were selected for neutralizing their activity. So they bind in the catalytic uh, site and completely block substrate access and substrate uh, citrullination. Really uh, wonderful tools to have. And as you can see, uh, the antibody that's specific for PAD2 can completely block the activity of recombinant PAD2, and vice versa for the antibody against PAD4 can block the activity of uh, recombinant PAD4. So we did the experiment then with neutrophils uh, with these two antibodies, and what you can clearly see is that 
if you have neutrophils in the medium and they citrullinate um, uh, histone and you add the PAD2 neutralizing antibody, not much happens, little reduction maybe. If you add the PAD4 antibody, there's a great reduction. If you add BOR, the, both together, the activity is completely gone. In the supernatant, it's a different story. If you add a PAD2 antibody, uh, not much uh, changes. But if you add the PAD, uh, sorry, if you add the PAD2 antibody, you block the activity. If you add the PAD4 antibody, not much happens. And of course, both together still block everything. So we end up with um, uh, the conclusion that neutrophils can pa uh, uh, secrete PAD2. Uh, which then leaves uh, that extracellular enzyme as a potential uh, contender for what is going on in, in rheumatoid arthritis uh, patients. So let me turn to the citrullination mechanism that I think is the most uh, promising for being what happens in patients. So, and that's the, the so-called hypercitrullination. And uh, that's a term that we use, sorry, a term that we use because uh, we get such a uh, tremendously strong uh, citrullination of so many proteins if we do it. So uh, let me walk you through a few things. So this side here is an immunoblot with an uh, antibody called F95 that uh, recognizes uh, citrulline. It's, it's not the greatest antibody, but under the right conditions, it, it serves uh, its purpose. On this side, we use another method. Uh, uh, so cit citrulline is a tiny, tiny uh, little end of an amino acid. You can't really expect an, uh, an antibody to easily recognize that alone. So F95, for example, clearly recognizes citrulline in a certain amino acid context. So it isn't pan-citrulline uh, uh, as you would like one to be. So AMC is, a, is another trick. It's a chemical modification that is fairly specific for citrulline. And then an antibody that modifies that chemical uh, modification. So you get a slightly different view, but as you can see, um, if you allow calcium to go into uh, neutrophils, you get this extensive citrullination of multiple uh, proteins. Um, you can get it, in fact, with just a, a, a detergent. But really importantly, you can get it with uh, perforin uh, that makes those pores uh, exactly the way that a cytotoxic T cell or NK cell would kill a, a neutrophil. So to understand this a little bit more, um, we identified by mass spec uh, about 30 proteins that became citrullinated in these uh, normal neutrophils in a few minutes after uh, allowing calcium to go in. And the reason, re only reason I show you this uh, list is that, um, you know, just to show you that we can do mass spec, but more so uh, because it turned out that about half of all those proteins have also been found in the citrullinated form in the synovial fluid of an RA patient, suggesting that what happens in these neutrophils when we allow calcium to rush into them results in citrullinated proteins that you also do find in an RA patient. So this sort of increases the likelihood in, in my thinking that um, this could be what happens in the patients. And I'll show you that more in a second. Uh, one just curious, uh, this is a sidetrack, uh, please forgive me. Uh, one of the proteins that were citrullinated uh, is a very interesting one. It's part of the NAPDH oxidase mechanism in neutrophils. And in fact, uh, the, one of the citrullinated sites, so we identified uh, six uh, citrullinated uh, arginines in this protein, and they cluster in two places that seem important. Arginine 90 is an interesting residue because there's a uh, single nucleotide polymorphism that changes arginine to histidine that is uh, associated with human autoimmunity. And it's led people to study uh, what this oxidase might be doing, autoimmune disease. It appears that um, the, the NAPDH oxidase in neutrophils has an anti-autoimmunity uh, uh, role uh, that is then uh, gone in the, in the uh, polymorphism. So that's interesting that citrullination occurs at the same uh, residue. So let me go back to uh, the patients. Um, so uh, about six months ago, uh, Katie Nee joined my uh, lab and uh, quickly started uh, isolating uh, neutrophils uh, and uh, lymphocytes from RA patients, studying uh, what occurs in them, both by uh, immunoblotting with the same 
techniques I just showed you in, in uh, neutrophils, uh, as well as by uh, flow cytometry. So here's one experiment that summarizes many different uh, biologies in, in one uh, slide. So these are neutrophils uh, from an RA patient uh, with not particularly active disease. Um, and we treat the neutrophils, we treat the neutrophils either with uh, TNF, which induces more PAD4 on the surface, as I showed you a moment ago, or we treat them with uh, ionomycin for a short time that will induce a calcium influx, or we treat them with forbolester, which is a very powerful inducer of netosis. And then we uh, added fibrinogen to the medium to allow extracellular uh, citrullination to be visible, and then we uh, blotted everything in the end with the anti-modified citrine to see all of the citrullination reactions inside the cell and outside the cell. And what we see is this, uh, I think, very striking pattern where there is, um, this really represents uh, what PAD4 on the surface of the cells would do, maybe with some contribution of PAD2. So yes, fibrinogen was citrullinated uh, in this case. Um, maybe a little bit more so after TNF uh, stimulation, but not particularly much. What happens in the middle lanes where you see a huge amount of citrullination represents um, what either MAC or perforin would do by allowing calcium to go in. And then finally in the last lanes, the citrullination would, would occur uh, during uh, netosis, which uh, I am not particularly impressed with. So my overall take of this kind of experiment is that uh, a likely uh, mechanism for an extensive citrullination is, is um, this mechanism of punching holes in, in uh, neutrophils. And I'll show you one experiment that is so fresh it's still uh, warm on the printer. This is uh, a, a data point from uh, less than a, a couple of weeks ago. So, this, uh, so what we try to do here is to analyze, so let me back up. Assuming that the hypercitrullination is what happens in patients, how do we prove that? Well, the way to prove that would be to find that a fraction of neutrophils straight out of a patient would have either perforin protein or MAC membrane attack complex of, of complement on their very surface. So this is the first time uh, we saw that. So in this particular uh, RA patient uh, who has a, an active disease, uh, about 1.3%, uh, 1.24% of the neutrophils uh, seem to be staining positive with the MAC antibody. And Kate has done quite a bit of work to um, optimize the use of this antibody and use the controls that you would like. Um, for example, she treats uh, some of the cells with trips in to see if we can get rid of it uh, from the surface, and it does reduce uh, the response. Another donor, uh, really, I consider this a, a negative uh, background uh, finding. So this is very exciting and, and uh, needs to be followed up as a first uh, experiment. But very uh, curiously, in that same patient, when we took those neutrophils that had MAC on their surface and we put them in the medium with calcium, um, whether we add ionomycin, as we did in this side, or not, we get this citrullination to occur spontaneously in those neutrophils. Never seen this before. Um, and I assume that uh, we will have to uh, find this multiple times before we can uh, convince uh, anybody that this is real. But to me, it's a wonderful first indication that there might be a membrane attack complex on the surface of neutrophils, at least in some RA patients, that can mediate uh, this kind of citrullination uh, reaction. So I think the question that all of this work uh, made me ponder many times is if, if you then uh, assume that either MAC or perforin uh, would be the mechanism for pathological situation in RA patients, why on earth would neutrophils want to be killed? I mean, why would the immune system come in either with, with uh, membrane, uh, with, with uh, complement, you know, that could be activated, for example, by antibodies, or perforin, which would represent how a cytotoxic T cell or an NK cell would kill a neutrophil. Why would that happen? So I've been scratching my uh, head for a while, looking throughout the literature for anything that would be 
known to be expressed on neutrophils that the immune system would have any reason to see as uh, problematic or foreign. And the only thing I do find uh, in a literature that's about 30 years old, it's coming and going, uh, there's some recent papers uh, to revive the whole idea, uh, which is an endogenous uh, retrovirus uh, called HERV-K. So I'm going to give you just a brief um, uh, introduction to what, what uh, is known about HERV-K and tell you why uh, this is not a completely crazy uh, idea. So the role of uh, retro elements and retrovirus in autoimmunity, like I said, has a 30-year history. It started with a number of very surprising findings uh, published in multiple papers, and there were uh, even um, regular newspaper articles about this finding. It was so surprising. So it turned out that uh, serum from many patients with autoimmunity, including RA, were positive when immunoblotted against uh, HIV protein even if these patients certifiably had never encountered the virus and were not positive for HIV. And it was a fairly large percentage of, uh, of patients with SLE and RA and uh, other autoimmune diseases. Here's some examples. And they did, they, uh, did not find these autoantibodies in healthy people. Uh, it led to an onslaught of uh, papers uh, that uh, speculated uh, this and speculated that. I call it the mosaic of uh, claims uh, this never really went particularly far, but it be became clear that the proteins that uh, autoimmune patient autoantibodies were recognizing were not actually HIV, but encoded by endogenous retroviruses, which are uh, structurally and functionally related to uh, HIV. Actually, HIV is technically speaking a member of the HERV-K family because it uses the lysine tRNA for priming its uh, reverse transcription. So there were all these papers uh, for a number of years. People uh, thought about molecular mimicry. People thought about super antigen functions and all sorts of uh, proposals. And it sort of petered out uh, after a few while, and then came back and petered out and is becoming uh, a topic again. So this is what it's all about. When a retrovirus uh, exemplified by HIV, but we now know that this kind of retrovirus have infected uh, our ancestors uh, thousands of times, maybe much more than that uh, over evolutionary time. Um, in the relatively short evolutionary time of 30 or 40 million years, these viruses have infected us several hundred times. And the reason we know that is that Actually, what we do know is only those infections that reach the germ line. So any infections that remained in um, you know, T cells like HIV do not go into the germ line. But those that do become inherited and go on. So all of us in this room have uh, a large, large number of retroviral sequences uh, in our genome. It's about 8% of our genomes, which is about five times more than all the uh, protein coding uh, exons in our genome, which is kind of a shocking thing to realize. Um, we can also tell that this has happened multiple times uh, much uh, earlier in time because the old uh, retrovirus transcriptional hotspots called the LTRs are all over the genome. And in fact, the regulation of many normal genes are based on old retroviral sequences that were found to be useful and were kept. So. We are full of these things. They all uh, tend to look like this. They have, those that are intact, they have uh, an LTR, LTR sequence in each end and a GAG and a prote uh, protease and a pole and an ENV gene in between. So we are interested in, and I made a few assumptions. One of them is that all the old stuff that's been in our genome for a long, long time and doesn't encode uh, uh, fully functional large proteins we can probably ignore. And I think it's much more uh, likely that those um, uh, endogenous retroviruses that came in, arrived in our genome really recently and are still intact and can still make virions are much more likely to be problematic uh, for our health. And that brings the number of lo loci to think about down to a much smaller number. And it really brings it down to one family called the HERV-K. So the HERV-K uh, family 
uh, first uh, infected our ancestors about 44 million years ago, and it's been infecting uh, the germline repeatedly ever since, at least 120 times reaching the germline. Uh, the most recent ones are much less than a million years old, and they look completely intact. Uh, fortunately, uh, however, there are one or two mutations in them, and they are apparently no longer fully infectious. They are clearly reduced in their infectivity. Although we cannot exclude the possibility that there are still wild uh, Herv K out there that could infect uh, humans again. Um, one indication that these are recent is that some people have uh, certain uh, loci of these recent ones, uh, other people don't. So there's an insertional polymorphism uh, in here. And just to show you real quickly, um, Herb K can be resurrected with point mutations to restore the original sequence, which you can deduce from uh, analyzing the family. And if you bring them uh, back, you get uh, particles that look slightly different from HIV. Uh, they are fully infectious. They will reintegrate the genome into an infected host cell. These are uh, uh, fully functional retroviruses. Uh, they infect uh, differently than HIV. They have to be endocytosed um, and um, allowed for analysis of how they infect. And I'm actually going to skip this slide this is just to show you that they do process proteins in a similar way to HIV. They, in fact, look a little bit like a stripped-down version of HIV with a little bit fewer accessory uh, proteins. So how could this then be relevant for autoimmunity? So normally, uh, elements that come into our genome are kept in check by DNA methylation, by epigenetic mechanisms. Genes that are not selected for uh, the genome doesn't really want to express. So most um, uh, of these sites are highly uh, silenced uh, by a number of mechanisms. But there are a few conditions where we know uh, Herb K can be uh, re-expressed, and one of them turns out to be rheumatoid arthritis. So what you need is a uh, decreased uh, genomic methylation. The LTRs are wonderful transcription factor binding sites. So if Herb K is expressed, um, we, we know the mRNA will be processed and translated, and you will get all the proteins um, uh, that it encodes for, and they will spontaneously assemble into a bud uh, that uses the envelope protein and a portion of the GAG protein for assembly, and then it, uh, it will pack in its uh, RNA transcript and become a uh, virion. And some of the Herb case can still do all of that, although this no longer is, is fully functional. So you could then imagine that uh, these proteins uh, can all be processed either directly and presented on MHC, or the virion could be endocytosed, or it could bud off, it probably is tremendously immunogenic like a virus because of how it's built. So in antipresenting cells, it could be processed and then presented on MHC. And as a result, you would expect there to be T cell and B cell uh, immunity against uh, this thing. So I wouldn't be telling all of this if I didn't have any data to show you that this indeed occurs in, in rheumatoid arthritis uh, and actually other diseases as well. So we uh, purchased a protein that was commercially available to get a quick start. Um, it's the um, envelope protein. What they sold us was everything that's extracellular, which I, I thought was the most interesting piece. They skipped the, um, the intracellular parts and transmembrane helix because that's just make it more difficult to express. And uh, Xu Yig, who was a volunteer in my lab, and Vicky, who is my uh, lab manager, did a heroic effort of uh, gels. They run this uh, recombinant protein on, on gels and cut them into stripes again and again and blotted each stripe with uh, serum from a different uh, RA patient and actually from healthy volunteers and from uh, a few patients with other uh, diseases. And as you can see very clearly, uh, most Many of those uh, strips give you a very uh, clear and distinct band at the exact size of the envelope protein. Some patients do it weekly. Uh, healthy volunteers either not at all or they have a faint little band. And we actually have seen a few uh, non-RA patients have a little bit stronger bands as well. So in summary, the 73 patients they uh, went through in
in, in a, a couple of months. Um, about 30-something percent didn't have much antibodies, um, and 30-something had uh, strong ones, and about 16 percent had really strong uh, such antibodies. Now, this is a recombinant uh, E. coli made protein. We might be missing antibodies um, against the native protein that some patients may have. So we constructed an ELISA out of these um, using a, a piece of that uh, protein. Uh, a reasonable correlation between the immunoblots and the ELISA, not quite perfect. Uh, and we find a few interesting things. One of them is that uh, patients uh, who have uh, anti-citrullinated autoantibodies tend to have more of these anti uh, herb k envelope uh, autoantibodies. And I call them auto antibodies because uh, herb k really is part of us uh, since uh, millions you know, of years. Although you, you uh, may not like the auto part in auto antibodies. Um, we also find uh, very interesting that smokers have, and there's a fairly small number of smokers in our cohort of RA patients, but they have really high, including some of the highest uh, titers against the envelope protein. I, I puzzled over that and found uh, recent in the literature um, the HERV-K uh, LTR promoter region is strongly stimulated by cigarette smoking in, uh, for example, patients with uh, prostate cancer. So it might be related to the expression of HERV-K in these individuals. There's also a nice uh, correlation uh, with um, extracellular DNA and uh, myeloperoxidase uh, from neutrophils. So there appears to be some um, uh, association between uh, neutrophil death, perhaps by netosis or by other means, and the presence of these uh, autoantibodies. It doesn't prove anything, but I find it intriguing. So then um, last summer I had a very talented uh, college student uh, many of you probably know there's an exchange program between UW and Gonzaga University. So Amanda Hefton uh, was in my lab for 10 weeks and uh, managed to do some really great experiments in a short amount of time. She's uh, the first author of one paper that was already accepted and she's going to be first author on, on uh, this work as well. So what she did is uh, she repeated the ELISAs with the, with the envelope protein but included an additional step to make that protein citrullinated. So we uh, um, had to do a few tricks to block uh, the plates without getting citrullination of BSA, uh, which is readily citrullinated. Um, and then we incubated the envelope protein in half the samples uh, with PAD4 and then did, washed it away and did the ELISA. And what you can see very clearly here is that there is now much higher titers in a much larger number of RA patients. So RA patients, um, many of them have autoantibodies against citrullinated uh, envelope protein from herb K. So finally, we have a little link between citrullination biology and herb K in a way that I did not expect at all. Um, you can see there are a few patients who, so this graph is connecting the same patient with a line. So this particular individual has autoantibodies against unmodified envelope and exactly the same titer if you citrullinate envelopes. So the antibodies recognize something that is not citrullinated. While many patients down here had very little uh, antibodies against the envelope, but great titers against the citrullinated envelope protein. So we used this in a larger set of uh, ELISA assays with a larger cohort of, uh, of RA patients. And what we find is that there is a, a good correlation uh, with a rheumatoid factor. There is a very co strong correlation with um, anti-citrullinated autoantibodies uh, and to taken together uh, seropositivity, we get a very good uh, correlation. Uh, we also find that uh, most healthy volunteers do not have these antibodies, although in a larger cohort, which is included here, we did see a, a few. And there is a trend towards an association, although it's not quite statistically significant, with joint erosions, suggesting that these citrullinated envelope antibodies um, are, are more common and uh, at high titers in patients who have a worse and more uh, aggressive disease. So, you know, as you can see, these uh, unexpected data often provoke questions that uh, we then ponder over.
So the question that came from those data was, why, why would the envelope protein be citrullinated? That doesn't make any sense. Well, it actually does make a beautiful uh, amount of sense uh, when you, when you uh, realize that the, the way that HERV-K infects cells, and, and by the way, many other viruses as well, is by binding to heparin sulfate on surface proteins. So heparin sulfate is a highly acidic uh, carbohydrate. So in order to bind to uh, acidic um, uh, ligand receptor needs to have basic charges, so arginines and lysines. And indeed, when you look at the envelope protein, it's full of arginines and lysines. The, the um, extracellular piece, the, the part of the envelope that looks like the hat, hat on the mushroom, has 21 arginines. So there's plenty of room for citrullination, number one. Number two, if you citrullinate, uh, those residues that are important for heparin sulfate binding, you would expect binding to be diminished or lost. So could it be that neutrophils uh, citrullinate extracellular proteins as a defense mechanism against viruses that use heparin sulfate as their receptor, maybe including HERV-K? Um, that would be a, uh, I think, clear uh, reason to assume. So this would explain why we said, you know, just a moment ago, I showed that neutrophils can secrete PAD2 and that they have PAD4 on the surface. Now, Maybe that's then because these um, enzymes serve a host defense function that hasn't been uh, previously recognized. And this, of course, we will have to uh, follow up with experiments and using other viruses and so forth. Um, finally, I would just like to tell you that uh, the autoimmunity against uh, HERV-K is not restricted to the envelope protein. There are also autoantibodies in RA patients against the GAG protein. We haven't done quite an as extensive a study yet, and we would love to have some of the other HERV-K proteins uh, and, of course, controls from other places. But what I can tell you is that um, there are RA patients who have anti-envelope autoantibodies, there are RA patients who have anti-GAG antibodies, and they are not always the same. The titers are not always in parallel. So, yes, many patients have both but there are patients who have one but not the other. And in fact, there are very, very few pa patients who don't have either or. So that sort of broadens the relevance maybe a little bit. So I, I think I'm going to uh, uh, skip this slide in the interest of time. I'm running a little low on time. Just to say that um, citrullination of the envelope print protein could be a part of uh, how uh, resurrected, re uh, reactivated HERV-K could become more immunogenic and result in responses that are uh, relevant for uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. These uh, antibodies, whether they recognize the envelope protein as such or citrullate, could also activate a uh, complement to do the MAC activation that we saw in that one uh, patient. And I probably haven't mentioned yet, but HERV-K is also strongly upregulated by estrogen and progesterone uh, controlled transcription factors and, and uh, to my knowledge is probably the first little hint of what could be involved in the uh, very unfair gender bias that rheumatoid arthritis exhibits about a four to one um, uh, female to a male ratio and I, I think I mentioned the cig cigarette smoking also does it so I think what may happen in rheumatoid arthritis then would be that HERV-K or possibly other things like that could induce uh, autoantibodies uh, that can activate complement, and of course there needs to be a T cell response uh, to get those antibodies. So if HERV-K is later on in life expressed in a neutrophil, you would expect that to result in an attack on that neutrophil by these antibodies and by the T cells uh, they would use the perforin, they would use the MAC to induce what would become a very strong citrullination in uh, those neutrophils. Of course, you could also imagine that uh, HERV-K could be reactivated in other cell types. And one that we are particularly interested in looking for would be the synoviocyte or anything else that's in the, in the synovium, in the joint. That could result in an immune response in the joint. Um, and if I ask today uh, rheumatoid arthritis experts when they talk about rheumatoid arthritis, if I ask them why the joint, nobody has a good answer to that question at, at this time. 
So I'm going to show you one final slide, and I think it's sort of last uh, minute or so. This is something that um, a, a fellow in rheumatology did uh, just about two years, maybe it's three years ago by now, uh, and it's very, very interesting. It's another disease uh, where all that I just talked about appears to play a role again. And it's uh, uh, large granular T-cell uh, leukemia, which is a malignancy uh, of uh, T-cells or NK cells with a hallmark of the malignant cells being highly cytotoxic and active, whether they are NK cells or CD8-positive toxic cells. And for some reason, they appear to, in that disease, want to kill neutrophils. And they do that very effectively because these patients are highly neutropenic. And there is another rheumatological condition that looks ex extremely similar called Feltis syndrome, where there's an expansion of T-cells, uh, CD8s, there's a neutropenia, and there's rheumatoid arthritis. So not every single patient uh, with this malignancy have rheumatoid arthritis, but about 30, 40, maybe 50% of the patients have both diseases. So what Tal uh, Gazit in the, in the lab uh, discovered is that these patients have extremely high titers of autoantibodies against citrullinated proteins. So this disease of neutrophil killing by the malignant T-cells appears to go with a tremendous neutrophil uh, uh, killing and citrullination. So for example here, if you compare the titers of anti-citrullinated autoantibodies in the patients with the leukemia and rheumatoid arthritis, uh, they have titers that are much higher than what we typically see in the highest sort of regular RA uh, patients. And then, um, much to my uh, surprise and, and maybe delight, we found that these patients also have very high autoantibodies against the Herb K uh, envelope protein, and these are still not even citrullinated. We've got to do uh, that as well. So there's a paper recently out at uh, large T-cell leukemia like a few other malignancies uh, activate herb K, uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer being the other ones. So you, you find here the constellation of citrullination, neutrophil killing, aggressive T cells, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and herb K uh, to potentially explain some of that killing. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, acknowledge um, the great team uh, I have um, all of them involved in this work, um, Amanda no longer in the lab, and I have uh, one more person, Xiao Xing, who is not on the slide yet, but will be shortly. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have.